Um, we are happy to welcome um, Professor Katrien de Schiermaker. She is um, talking to us today from the Plant Production uh, Systems Share Group at Wageningen University. Um, we've been working with um, her and her group in the working group on farming systems analysis in exons in economy, where we are trying to think of how farming systems analysis can add value to the agronomy research that we do in excellence in economy. Um, so, yeah, we're happy to have her uh, today uh, talking to us about um, understanding adoption constraints um, through farming systems analysis and how it can uh, be relevant in the context of our agronomy project. So, over to Katrine mm -hmm. and thanks again, everyone, for joining. Yes, thanks a lot, Elke, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, as I said, I see uh, quite a number of familiar names in the participant list, so that's uh, great to see. And uh, I hope that we can have a nice discussion uh, today. I will start with, um, with a presentation. Uh, I hope it will not take much more than half an hour so that we have uh, time to discuss afterwards. So let me try and share my screen with you just a quick confirmation that you see my first slide yes we can see it okay great um so yeah as elke said um today's topic is about um sorry i will just also click away my myself yes so the, as elke said the topic of today is to um, talk a little bit about how we can reveal um, or better understand adoption constraints for um, agronomic innovations um, through farming systems analysis um, so how do we want to um, do that well i will first start by taking you through what are important elements of farming systems analysis. Huh? What, what do we talk about when we, uh, when we refer to that approach? Um, I will then make it a little bit more specific and talk about the deed approach. And that deed approach um, starts with describing. Um, and I will give you some examples of that first phase. I will um, talk a little bit about farmer segmentation typologies and about distributions. The second phase of deed is about explaining. Again, I will give one example um, of how we can do that. Third phase is exploring. Again, um, two, three examples, I think, even in that one. And then a final one is on uh, designing. Uh, and here in particular, um, I will talk about one example of a project uh, that we've run with partners. Uh, and that was really about co-designing, so co-designing together with um, stakeholders. But first of all, what do we mean when we talk about farming systems analysis? And to um, start with that, I want to take us even one step back further um, and just um, talk about what do we mean with a system. And, um, and this is an example of a radio system, a transistor radio, a very old fashioned uh, transistor radio, maybe depending on your age, of course, maybe your grandmother or grandfather had uh, this type of radio in their homes. Um, and what does it consist of? Well, it consists of different components um, and we can we can see those components uh, in, in here within the case. And these components, they interact with each other. The components are contained within um, the case, the, the, the surrounding case of the radio. And because of the interaction between the components, there are certain emergent properties uh, and behavior of the system. And in this case, in the case of the radio, of course, it produces sound, it produces music, you may be able to listen to um, the news, etc. Of course, we're talking not about radios uh, today, we're talking about farming systems, but those key properties here, those four properties, we also see them coming back in farming systems. So what do we um, talk about when we talk about farming systems? Well, here's um, 
a famous cartoon that we use in in our chair group a lot uh, in our in our uh, classes uh, with students we we often start with this simplified cartoon where we look at a, a simplified version of a african farming system in this case and this farming system consists of two farm systems so we have a small farm um, surrounded by the the blue boundary a larger farm surrounded by the green boundary and you can see that within these two subsystems, if you like, of the bigger farming system, um, and in fact, the bigger farming system is surrounded by the, the red uh, dashed line, you can see that within these subsystems, we have components. We have fields. Um, we have fields with, which produce better crops than other fields. We have livestock. We have manure. We have home gardens. We have a household. Um, we have inputs that come from outside of the system and are brought uh, into the system. The arrows, they represent the uh, interactions between the components. Um, and then outside of the two farms, in this case, we have grazing land. It's outside the two farms, but it is inside the larger farming system. Now, to understand how this farming system functions, we need information from different domains of science. We need information from animal science, from ecology, from agronomy, from sociology even, uh, because these two farms, they interact. And in these interactions, people also play a role. Um, and so that leads me to an attempt of a, of a definition of what we mean with farming systems analysis. And, uh, that definition contains a number of elements. Um, so when we talk about farming systems analysis, we are talking about a holistic analysis that integrates different domains of science, different disciplines. It um, usually uh, contains a cross-scale analysis. We are not only looking at the field level or the farm level. No, we look at different levels and how they interact with one another. Farming systems analysis is, um, when it's done correctly, it is contextualized. So it, it means that it is place-based. It starts from an understanding of what happens in a particular context. And to be able to do that, we say that it is very good to do your analysis in a participatory way, involving the relevant stakeholders on the ground. Because um, yeah, I believe that you can't really understand the context if you don't um, involve the stakeholders of that context in your research. One other way of looking at it is uh, this one. It's a figure that comes from um, a massive online open course on systems thinking. Um, and so here we have the, um, the time um, dimension and we have a spatial dimension. And you see that for both these dimensions, we have different levels. And then we can start to understand what are the aspects that really play a role um, at field level, for example. At field level, when we talk about a season, we may look at crop production efficiency. When we talk about uh, different years, we may talk about efficiency in, um, uh, in rotations. And when we talk about longer time periods, we talk, for example, about soil organic matter um, content and the dynamics in um, soil health. At farm level, again, we can look at farm level issues in the different um, uh, temporal levels. Um, so in a season, you may look at uh, trade-offs in terms of resource allocation. Uh, from one to five years, we may want to look at risk avoidance. Longer time periods, we may want to look at livelihood stability. And the same applies to village level, where we um, may be interested in uh, product prices, institutions, infrastructure. So basically what we see is that as we go from smaller to larger scale levels, um, more and more it's the socioeconomic factors that start playing a role. And when we um, scale down, so when we go to the smaller um, spatial scale levels, more and more the biophysical factors play a more prominent role. 
So this is then a, a still a different way of looking at more or less the same thing, going from larger level here to smaller level over here, and then with an indication of the different um, approaches, tools, technology um, methods that we may employ in our farming systems analysis. Um, yeah, I'm not going to name them all. This is also when you when you look back at this uh, slide, you 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 can find this uh, resource perhaps useful. But it is important to note that the level, so what you see here, and the tool that you choose, that it is uh, determined by the research question you're asking, um, the aim of your um, project, etc. So um, we we don't start from the tool and then start looking for an interesting research question. No, it's really the other way around. We define a relevant research question for a particular context, and then we look for an appropriate tool or method. Okay, so that is in general um, a little bit what we're talking about when we talk about farming systems analysis. Now, how do we start to operationalize that? Well, um, what we find an interesting approach and a useful approach is the so-called deed approach. Um, and as I already explained, it consists of different phases. You start with, usually you start with describe, you then go to explain, explore and design. Um, but you see here a circle eh? and that indicates that this is really an iterative process. So you do it several times and by doing it several times, you start to learn more about what is happening. And if you do that learning together with stakeholders, you can um, then co-learning can, can emerge from that process. And ideally, you as an, as an output of your work, you, you may want to come up with uh, co-designs, innovations, options, uh, transition pathways, you name it. Um, here then, just again, some examples of the concrete uh, methods that are available in each of these phases. Again, I'm not going to name them all, but what we will do now is we will go through each of the phases um, step by step and then give some examples to make it a bit more concrete and then also I'll try to relate that to the, um, the topic of the talk, the adoption constraints. So we start with describe. And often when uh, in the describe phase, what we want to do is we want to describe diversity in, uh, for example, smallholder communities. And one very common technique to do that is to make farm typologies. Another word for that is farmer segmentation. And um, um, we have been working with some of the use cases in excellence in agronomy uh, on farmer segmentation. And I think I saw Rohit online. Uh, he's here in the team in Wageningen and he has been working uh, with some of the use cases uh, more concretely on um, making these typologies for the use cases. Here we see an example of um, something not related to excellence in agronomy, but this is just an illustration. It's an example from Burkina Faso, where we um, derived farm types based on um, orientation of the household. So are people more oriented towards, for example, marketing of their produce, or are they oriented more towards subsistence? Um, are they um, diversified or rather um, specialized on crop production, for example. So a combination of orientation and resource endowment. And here you see, you know, the typical results that you get when you do a statistical typology. So you get the, the PCA results, you get the clustering results, and based on that, you can identify your farm types. And so here in Burkina Faso, we had uh, two subsistence farm types, one oriented towards crops, the other oriented towards livestock. We had a market-oriented and diversified, and then a land-constrained but livestock-based uh, farm type. And so already from that, um, it gives us information on what uh, different households may be interested in and what they may or may not be able to adopt. Um, so I think it goes without saying almost that um, a crop-oriented a household in the crop-oriented farm type well, will we'll not be interested in um, forages, for example. So that is an obvious 
um, indication of how we can tailor the innovations we provide to farmers um, to, to their context. Um, very often what we try to do is we try to match in a way the statistical typology with the local reality. And we do that by also making a participatory typology. And here, uh, again, just, just as an illustration, um, we um, came up with rule, a rule-based typology, so with easy criteria, uh, like do people have cattle or a mo motorbike, a cart, etc., to um, subdivide households in different categories. And these are then uh, the categories that local farmers can really easily uh, relate to. So farm typologies, farmer segmentation is one thing, uh, but of course you lose some information in your PCA and in your clustering. Another um, technique that you can use when you want to describe diversity is to work with farm distributions. And here I'm just showing you one example of a study we did um, with Witse Marinus, a PhD candidate who recently graduated. Um, and he um, did some distributions for three sites here. So Nyando, Rakai, and Lushoto, all in, um, well, in East Africa, across different countries. And so here you just see the information for all the households individually ranked uh, from the smallest to the largest um, value that these households were able to create from on and off farm activities. And the colors indicate what these activities related to. So we have off farm, we have livestock, we have crops. And you see uh, with like one, by looking at it very easily, you can you can quickly see um, different orientations again. Huh? So uh, households that are much more, or sites where households are much more oriented towards uh, livestock production, for example, here in Nyando versus households that are much more oriented towards crops, for example, here in Rakai in Uganda. Now, what we indicated also here on this graph is the relation to living income and the poverty line. And so that um, also gives us a clear indication of um, yeah, the livelihoods of these households and their ability to invest in um, new innovations, for example. And again, the type of innovations that they may be interested in. So perhaps these households in Nyando that are oriented towards livestock production, they may not be so interested in, for example, mineral fertilizer. That, that could give us um, the beginning of an indication. Now, interestingly, what we also did in this study um, is, is this one here. So here we're, um, I'll try to explain the somewhat complicated graphs to you. So we have again the three sites. Huh? So we have Nyando, Rakai, Lushoto. And here we um, ordered the household in um, order of increasing cultivated area. Yeah, cultivated area is uh, plotted on the y-axis. And then we confront the cultivated area with the viable farm size for different scenarios. So the horizontal lines are different scenarios. So B1 is the baseline, um, so the current situation. And this is the size of the farm that you need to produce a living income. So here in Neando, we see that if households would only rely on uh, crops, all of the farms would be too small to create a living income because all the households are below level B1. If we would also include the costs, because B1 is only based on revenues, if we also include the costs, then it's even worse. Okay. Now in Rakai, the situation looks much better huh? because there about, let's say, 50% of the households are um, have a, a farm size that is above the, uh, the needed farm size in the baseline scenario. Now, when it becomes interesting as well, when, when you then look at what is uh, what would be required when we would be uh, able to improve yields uh, under scenario I1. Um, so for example, through agronomic innovations. Now you see in Neando that uh, then the level drops, but still 
I would say about three quarters of the households don't have a viable farm size for um, that scenario. So that indicates to us that um, three quarters of the households may not be interested in investing in these technologies because even if they would do it, they would not be able to obtain a living income. So what we conclude from, from this analysis is that farm size can, uh, in many cases, be a really important limiting factor. Um, yes, I think that's um, more or less the most important message from this slide. So let me continue. Um, so we, we move then to the next phase of the deed cycle, the explain phase. And here I want to focus on what we can do with multi-location trials that are uh, spread over the landscape um, and how they help us to explain variability in yield and yield response to figure out which options could work best, where, when, why, and for whom. So in other words, it helps us uh, if we are able to explain variability, it helps us to identify um, niches. So here is an example from Mali from a couple of years ago where we uh, conducted um, numerous on-farm trials, um, simple trials with four treatments, small plots. Um, and we, we um, really saw a huge variability um, in space and also in time, but I'm focusing here on the space aspect. And you can see the variability on the picture, um, the, the difference between two fields in terms of the soybean yield is, uh, is quite uh, large. And you see it obviously also in the box plots. Now, there's another way of plotting it, and that is by using cumulative probability uh, curves. And then we can easily, well, if we put the benefit cost ratio on the x-axis, we can easily see that uh, for two different options here, just two examples, um, well, in this case, about 70% of the households, they have a benefit cost ratio below one. And here for the local variety with fertilizer, it's about 50% of um, the households. And so this um, high probability of not being able to create um, profit is obviously a huge disincentive for farmers. Huh? That, that risk is an important um, adoption constraint. And so this type of um, multi-location trials helps us to reveal um, that constraint. Now, when we then combine, explain, and design, we can start to use that information to then think about, okay, what now fits best where? Um, so you, you start to design um, crop allocation strategies. So here we have our uh, famous basket of options that we, that we tested in the different locations. And what we then found out was that certain options work better in certain soil types and in certain um, places in the rotation, right? So those are, those are also things that you don't find out if you're just doing your trials um, in one or two years and just on a particular soil type, right? You, you really have to um, try and do your trials across locations and um, across years. Um, so here are yeah, some examples of these so-called niches that we then identified. Okay, well, we move on then to the third phase in the deed cycle, the explore phase. And here I want to pay a little bit of attention to um, the, um, the power, the, the, the usefulness of participatory modeling using really simple farm models that, that you know, you don't need a lot of data, you don't need a lot of time to run them and you can, yeah, you can almost use them sitting next uh, to, to a farmer. And this is just an example of such a very simple farm model where we just represent the major components in the farm system. And um, indeed you can do it sitting next to a farmer, but you can, uh, you then need a way to translate your model findings 
uh, into something that that farmers can relate to. And that's what you see happening here with these uh, with these uh, graphs, the drawings, etc. And so um, what we try to do in this exercise with farmers is to um, replace one crop with another um, and then to explore what happens in terms of two important um, farmers criteria. And we chose together with them the food self-sufficiency criterion and the um, income criterion. And so depending on the farm type, we then um, looked for what would be the best option. And we looked at what would happen if we replace, in this case, sorghum by soybean. So we, we see that uh, food self-sufficiency would decrease. That's not surprising, but that farm income would um, really increase. And food self-sufficiency could be maintained above, uh, above one in this case. For large farms, we found that uh, the best option would be to replace maize by maize cowpea intercropping without a penalty in food self-sufficiency. And for the small farms, we found that the best option was to replace sorghum by cowpea grain. But here you see that it starts to drop uh, below one, the food self-sufficiency. So uh, this is an important trade-off and it looks like a cutoff point. Um, so that also the increase in income is more limited. And we then translated these income levels to something concrete for that farmers could really easily relate to. Um, let me see. In the interest of time, I will skip this example um, and switch to the design example. The, the, the one I'm skipping is just another exploration example where we looked at trade-offs. So the design example comes from a, a project that we did in Zimbabwe with uh, partners there. And I saw Patricia was online. So actually Patricia was part of this team. Um, so um, I hope she will recognize uh, what I'm telling here. Um, and so um, this was part of um, an AGMIP project from a couple of years ago. And I think it's a nice example that shows really the power of farming systems analysis. So we addressed a couple of research questions. Firstly, we wanted to look at what is the impact of climate change and adaptation options on crops and on livestock, so on different farm system components, but also on household level indicators. So here you see the, the, the cross-scale analysis. Uh, we looked at differences between farm types and we looked at what would be needed for a transition to sustainable farming systems. And here you see some of that iterative process coming back um, where uh, I'm, I'm going to focus a bit on the, on the co-design, but it is really, um, I mean, you start from a modeling exercise, you discuss that with stakeholders, you design pathways, you discuss those pathways with the stakeholders, you make adaptations uh, to it, um, and in the end, you, you want to assess impact, of course. And so we described this whole process in, uh, in a recent paper. Um, so I'm going to take you through it very quickly. Um, I hope uh, not too quickly. Um, so first step, what is the impact of climate change on crops and livestock? We looked at a couple of contrasting uh, climate scenarios, hot, dry and hot, wet scenarios for different uh, RCPs. Um, for the crops, we looked at different soils. So this is actually work by Patricia. Um, and for livestock, we looked at what would be the impact of climate uh, change on milk production, but also other, um, we also looked at um, offtake rates, we looked at mortality, etc. So this, this is generated based on a crop growth model here and a livestock model uh, for this one. So that is at the level of the farm components. And then we integrated it to household level indicators. So we looked at food self-sufficiency, but also at farm income. And we distinguished between uh, poor farmers, uh, medium and so-called better off uh, farmers. And then we looked at farm net returns here in the baseline um, 
scenario and here in the climate change scenario. And then you see that for the poor, actually the climate change did not have a huge impact. They were at really low levels in the baseline and they remained more or less there. For the medium farm types, a small decrease and for the better off, um, quite significant uh, decrease. So they felt it more strongly in relative terms. Now, what can be done to adapt to climate change? Well, we first tried uh, an incremental adaptation package where we intensified cereal production and we included fodder legumes in, um, in the system to improve um, animal feeding and to also generate rotational benefits to the cereals. And not surprisingly, we found, and I'm not going to show these results, we found that at the field level and at the herd level, yes, these adaptation packages, they improved crop and livestock productivity. So great, but if we integrate it to the household level, we see that actually the adaptation package doesn't help very much. And you see that in this graph. So the poverty level indicates the percentage of people that are below the poverty line in each of the farm types. Now you see that for the poor, that's almost 100%. But even for the better off, they are at relatively high poverty levels still. And so that's important to, uh, to understand. Now, in the climate change scenario, the poverty levels for the two first groups, they remain more or less the same. And for the better off, they increase. And that's related to the fact that um, climate change had a larger impact on revenue for the better off farmers. Now, with the adaptation package, we see that poverty levels decline. So great. But we also saw that poverty levels remained um, about 70, 80% for the two lower resource endowed groups and remained around 40% even for the better off group. So clearly we and the stakeholders were absolutely not happy with this. So we went back to the drawing board and looked at what could be now really transformative changes that could really um, set these farming systems onto a path towards um, better sustainability. So we did that uh, with stakeholders by uh, through a workshop um, to um, co-design basically um, representative agricultural pathways in which we looked at more drastic changes that would really lead to positive outcomes. And here I'm highlighting some of the elements in, um, in these pathways. And so, uh, for example, it consisted of a, a large expansion of the cultivated land, an expansion of the herds, crop diversification and intensification, and the inclusion of legumes in the system. So really a package of uh, changes that we um, included in those pathways. And then what did it lead to? Well, here you see what it led to in terms of farm net returns. So here we have the situation with climate change, climate change and the first adaptation package. So not a huge increase in farm net returns, but a more significant increase um, with the transformative um, package. And then in terms of the poverty levels, so this is what we looked at before the meager decline in the incremental package, and then a more substantive decline in the transformative um, situation, but still 50% uh, poverty levels in the poor category of farmers. So here, yeah, you could say that for these really vulnerable households, there is um, not really a future in agriculture because even with huge changes in the agricultural system, these people would still um, be uh, in poverty. Good, so I'm running a little bit out of time, but here are we're at the end of the presentation, so we still have a bit of time to discuss. Um, so just to, to, to repeat again the main uh, points uh, that were part of farming systems analysis in all these different examples. So we have the integration of different domains, the integration also of scale levels from field to farm community landscape scale, regional scale in some uh, um, cases, 
a combination of um, empirical observations, experiments, and modeling can often be really useful. And uh, what is really important also is the engagement with farmers and other stakeholders. And I believe that a combination of these um, elements can help us to indeed to, to discover what are um, critical adoption constraints and to, to adapt the agronomic innovations that we are proposing um, to farmers in line with, uh, with those insights. So that was it. Thank you very much um, for listening. I hope uh, there are still some people there and uh, I hope we can um, discuss. I will maybe leave my um, presentation there or we can always go back to it. Maybe that's, uh, I will stop sharing. It's maybe easier that we can see each other a bit. Is someone uh, uh, chairing the discussion or shall I do that? I see that Mandla has his hand up. So Mandla, please uh, go um, ahead. Th thanks, thanks a lot, Katrien, for the very interesting presentation already seen from the comments that others also found it very interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm willing to moderate if it can help. <laughs> um, there are a few questions in the uh, chat box, but maybe let's uh, start with Mandla. Mandla was his hand up. Go ahead, Mandla. I'm not hearing anything. Hear me too. Yeah. Um, Barbara, are the participants able to mute themselves? Uh, Manla says I can't unmute. Mm -hmm. I see that in the chat here. Yeah, maybe we should start by taking a question from the chat. Yeah. Is that a? Let's do that. And maybe uh, Barbara, if you could check it out, how people can. Can mute themselves or how we can unmute. Yeah. Um, so in the chat, um, there is a comment from uh, Thank you for the tools. As far as the adaptation is concerned, it's very much influenced by the gender dynamics. What were few of the insights as far as the gender dynamics? Okay, yeah, so a question on gender indeed. So yeah, um, I didn't pay too much attention to gender, I realize now in the in the examples that I chose. Um, that's not deliberate, so uh, apologies for that. Um, I think an important one is when it comes to to labor issues. Uh, and that is that should really also be always part of um of a farming systems analysis that you look at what are the labor requirements uh, of new innovations um, and and very often what we see is that uh, different gender groups they have different uh, roles when it comes to agricultural activities and so there will be different uh, gender um, labor requirements for the different gender groups so that is definitely something um, to look to look into and to include um it it can also um i mean it also often relates to what what um what people can invest so their access to different resources including capital um and so um taking taking that into account is uh, is very important as well and can lead to insights that are gender differentiated so these are two examples right uh, and perhaps yeah because i i'm not sure if manla can now ask uh because otherwise i can maybe give another example yeah, yeah i can i can okay. thank, thank right. you so much okay. katrin yeah. and uh yeah great great presentation i i caught uh, probably half of it but I think I probably caught the one that uh, was very much of interest to me. I think for me, the last bit where you're looking at um, the the potential impacts of adaptation strategies for the different, um, you know, pharma typologies and uh, the very clear sense around, well, first of all, if farmers are already starting off with uh, a level of uh, a critical mass of assets, 
Uh, mm -hmm. their, their ability to benefit from adaptation strategies is much, much better. Uh, and, and therefore, my question is, then uh, should really our advisories uh, be only stopping at saying, um, you know, grow this crop in this particular way? Or should we be bundling those advisories with asset accumulation uh, strategies, it might be outside the realm of the CG, but it's very clear that the vulnerability of farmers increases almost exponentially the less endowed with assets they are mm -hmm. uh, and their ability to respond. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, as an implementer, I'm really keen to see what I do with this research because it's really sparking a lot of thoughts in my mind. Thank you. Mm, yeah, thanks for that, Mandla. Indeed. Um, I think what you observe is is uh, correct in 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 most cases eh? that um, people who have more resources uh, available they are better placed to to invest in new things they are uh, better cushioned uh, against risks so um, indeed and and some of these things you mentioned bundling and I I really uh, yeah, I, I like that because because that is also something we're we're looking into in a in a new project uh, where we're looking into what what is the option to bundle technical innovations uh, or agronomic practices with um, institutional or social innovations, uh, for example, in terms of credit provision, in, for example, in terms of insurance provision. Um, um, contractual arrangements between farmers and traders. So these things can really um, help in, um, in in taking away some of the adoption constraints. So, um, and I do think that, um, I mean, we also within a program like Excellence in Agronomy, there, there is probably room to, um, to look at that, right? At, at these uh, bundling opportunities. And as, as researchers, we can we can our role to me at least our role in that in that process is to um, generate knowledge on what types of bundles could work best for which types of farmers and what types of um, social institutional bundles could be best combined with what type of um, technical innovations. So um, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. You did. And uh, I really like this idea of uh, socio institutional bundles, right? Uh, going mm -hmm. together with uh, just basic uh, agronomic advisories. Yeah. Um, and, and, and for me, it then triggers the question, uh, Katrin and colleagues, to say, uh, so this, this, this asset accumulation that creates the, the right level of a safety net uh, is not going to to naturally find itself evolutionary, right? Uh, how do we, you know, how do we map those asset accumulations? So if, if we're supporting farmers for maize and soybeans in Northern Ghana or in Southern Africa, then doesn't it make sense to partner with people who are using poultry or pork production to allow these farmers to kind of go a little bit faster. I don't know if any research has been done on that, but it would be interesting to see what those pathways look like uh, and how these socio-institutional bundles, as you're calling them, can actually move farmers to a better safety net because mm -hmm. those that you are saying will fall away and will not benefit and they've got no future in a changing climate. Uh, how many of those can be saved and 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 is there a pathway to that and anyway, i'm being philosophical but it's your fault katrin <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i'm I, for sure i don't have an answer to that um to that philosophical question <laughs> um but i think it's a it's a really relevant to a relevant question to ask ourselves and um um i i mean again reflecting on the role of research in this is is because these are um important messages to policymakers i would say that that really like important parts of uh, rural populations don't have a future in 
in farming, like sending though, I mean, making sure that policymakers hear these mes messages, understand them, are able to identify where these people are, who they are. I think that that is where um, research does have a role to play. Um, and yeah, um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Thanks a lot, Katrin. Thanks, Mama. Um, I don't see any other hands. Is there anyone else who wants to their mic? Now, Leo has a uh, has his hand up. Leo has his hand. Yes, go ahead, Leo. I'm muted. Hi, Katrin. Hi, Leo. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Nice, nice to listen to you and and hearing about the deed. Yeah, reminding you about deed, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good reminder. So, yeah. yeah. So I was just um, thinking about the the deed cycle uh, in the recent discourse around human centered design. Uh huh. And um, so I wonder who is the main actor in these stages? Who is doing? Who is leading? D D double E D along all these stages. Um, because it's 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 important that well we capture you know recent issues that are coming through uh, gender issues and stuff. So I'm, I'm I'm just wondering who is it the researcher who is the main actor and also in the context of core design. I, I heard you mention that as well, core development and core design. But yeah, maybe you can take uh, you can share your thoughts around that. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I really like the question. Um, and in, in my perspective, who is leading, it, it evolves and it depends on the type of project, the type of research you're doing, the type of questions you're asking. Um, and um, perhaps it's research that is in the lead in the beginning, um, but again, depending on the type of project, but I would say ideally, uh, but perhaps we can discuss about whether that's our our ideal. But I I would say ideally you would want to um, enable a process where after time um, it is it is farmers and stakeholders themselves who who can direct um, the research based on their questions so that more and more they become in the lead in terms of um, asking the questions they want to see answered. Um, and so at least then after a while they could become in the lead of the process. Perhaps they are not in the lead of, you know, the statistical uh, analysis that is at the basis of identifying niches. Perhaps that is still the work of the researcher, but it could be that the, um, the farmer uh, organization becomes in the lead of the process. And um, the example I gave you from, from Mali um, is an example of where I've seen things starting to shift a little bit. Um, perhaps it's exaggerated to say that there the farmers are really in the lead already, but over the course of of um, uh, of ten years that we're working there now, um, we have been able to um, well we set up a farmer research network. That's how we called it, uh, and gradually we've um, we've encouraged farmers to. Um, you know, to ask questions themselves, to um, share their their um, their opinions on performance of options that we're testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would say that gradually uh, that farmer research network um, became empowered to perhaps not lead, but at least steer that process in a way that that they found relevant. Okay, thank you for for that. Yeah. 
Thanks, Leona. Um, I can see Patricia types a question in the chat. And maybe you just want to open your mic, Patricia? She can go ahead. I've unmuted it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, hey. Hi, Patricia. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, I think my question was just prompted after seeing uh, the great work that we did in Zim. Uh, to say, for example, it's a lot of work to do the farming systems analysis. So yeah. then uh, my question was, how do you see this working, considering that most of the projects that we do, they are donor funded and mostly they come with their own objectives. And also by the time you get to understand the farming systems and uh, developing the packages, the project, sometimes it's almost uh, ending. Uh, then, yeah, I was actually thinking to say how best can we have follow up projects, for example, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Again, very nice question. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. It's something that we all struggle with. Uh, you're right. I mean, by the, if you go to, through the deed cycle and you start with describe, you then go to explain before you're in explore you're three years in into the project so um it's 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 indeed a very um critical point um and i and i think that that in some cases we we can uh we can and we should and we should just try and learn from our failures and i think we 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 should probably try to be a bit bold and perhaps sometimes start with explore and design based on you know existing knowledge um, very often projects they don't start really from scratch they uh, are put in in a certain place where um, the researchers but also the stakeholders that are there they have been working together they know the context to some extent so why not take um get into deed from from the end and start with with uh, something you want to immediately try out and then and then um, see what you can learn from that i think that would be also an interesting thing an interesting thing to try and probably we fail you know uh, in the beginning but then there would be a lot of learning also in that failure yeah sure yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks yeah Thanks, Patricia. Um, Suganda, you can go next. Uh, thanks, Katrin. And uh, this was really an eye opener model which you presented, the deed one. So, just uh, to introduce, we are developing the use case for South Asia and excellence in agronomy and uh, working on that for the South Asia planting dates use case. So, uh, I could actually reflect on when you presented the deed model and the structure. Convergence is the key from day one, as I could see uh, right in the beginning, that when we co-design, we co-develop, or even when we implement or experiment our uh, you know, uh, use cases or any project deliverables, it is important from day one to have the convergence. And that is just an example I wanted to put forward from the South Asia use case, where when we started developing this use case, from day one, we had partners, right? Who can be the scaling partners, who can be the partners who will own this change? And it is very important question uh, uh, which the last, uh, you know, last to last uh, uh, member asked about when we talk about human centric approach, right? Now the question is who leads? So it's about a shared leadership. From, you know, phases you will find that sometimes farmer leads, sometimes your, you know, partner organization like government bodies lead, or sometimes it's the research universities. So the, there is a shared leadership which happens through the convergence, and this helps us out to have a sustainable learning approach. And as you said that, you know, failure is a part of learning, right? So when you, we fail, we learn, and then we implement that, and then we see that, you know, the, your project time is over. Uh, so this was just an understanding I wanted to share about when the deep thing is there, convergence, and, uh, you know, uh, choosing right partners are very key when it comes to reach out to small and marginal farmers, because their needs are subjective, as you said, from you know farm level to the global level, it's completely different. And most important equally is the gender dynamics these days. Mm -hmm. So in India, where we are working right now, migration is one of the key issue, not only in India, but it's, it's a pan you know, global issue right now, 
people are drifting away from agriculture, going for non-farm work. Then migration also plays a very crucial role where the left behind women have to take the responsibility. So how do we also make from day one clear that women are our stakeholder? Whenever we reach out to any household, women has to be there. So, you know, these are few of the you know, insights I just wanted to put up uh, here and uh, because I could really resonate with your deed model. And definitely this is very, very important uh, a model which will be helpful for us. So thank you, Katrine and uh, Vanderman for this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Suganda. Uh, I'm not going to respond. I think this is a, just a very nice contribution. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think we have one more minute remaining. So, I mean, you can go for a quick question and then a quick answer. And then we have to go, go ahead and <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for excellent presentation. That is very nice. So very quick question on, I mean, when we do the farming uh, system analysis, especially the typology for research perspective, I think that is very good. But when you have now the technology to implement, how do you identify on the ground those categories? Because sometimes they seem to be more theoretical that in reality, it may be difficult. If you go from your sample, in the sample is still good. You can know from your sample who belong to uh, which group. And find, uh, the second point very quick is uh, Very quick, but then we lost your, uh, I think we've lost him uh, yeah. because that's the topic of this seminar. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we missed the second part of your question, but I can quickly answer the first part on the typology. So um, you're right that very often people think that typologies they're a, they're a theoretical concept and they're in the end not so useful on the ground. But I would I would disagree with that. I think there is often one step missing to make to make the typology concrete and applicable on the ground and that is to to translate your typology into an easy you know you could call it a decision tree so that very easily based on on two three four variables you can easily when you you talk to a farmer a new farmer that you don't know you ask him or her three four questions and you're able to say ah actually you are group one two or three or four and that is the, you can look back into the slides, that is the decision tree that I showed on one of the slides. And I think that is one step um, that, that we, we should not forget to take when we make a typology, make it very concrete and actionable. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the question will share, I mean, the slide can be shared with everyone who participated and even beyond that. So um, let us stop here with the questions and answers. Thanks a lot for the very enlightening and interesting presentation. Uh, at least I'm convinced we need farming systems analyzed in every scale in excellence in agronomy. Um, and thanks also for the um, for the participants for bringing coming with your interesting questions and discussions. Uh, so have a good rest of the day, everyone. And, uh, see you in the next webinar. Thank thanks you. a lot, everyone. Thanks. Great, everyone. great uh, stuff, uh, Katrin. Looking forward to reading more in detail. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, Katrin.